Well, I can't get that song out of my head now. We love a car sing along with Peter and Sean. Just half an hour to wait. Some strong language on BBC One with Joe Brand driving the show. Good evening and welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm staying alert. Uh, sorry, I mean, I'm Joe Brand, although I am also staying alert. Are you alert, Ian? I'm incredibly alert. I thought he said staying alive, which was sort of a Bee Gees reference that I'm taking very, very seriously. Last week on the show, we had this sculpture of uh, Chris Whitty by Penny Lally. Would you like to guess which public figure she sculpted this week? I can't imagine since you're asking me the question. Oh, that's very good. Oh, wow. Yes, now that is good. And <laughs> and just a touch <laughs> flattering. <laughs> Let's hope you never turn that colour. I think it looks like you've just remembered you've got something really fantastic in the fridge for later. If only that were true. Now, uh, in what historians <laughs> will call week eight of the first lockdown, Paul, how are you doing? I'm keeping my focus going. Um, by by going for walks and uh, my mental health is absolutely fine. Sorry, I should have warned everybody I was going to do that. <laughs> Why does sculptor just done a head of Ian? Why hasn't she picked other people in the public eye? Maybe she doesn't have much clay left, and Ian's got the smallest head. How dare you! <laughs> Now, on Ian's team tonight is political columnist Katie Balls, who was due to get married on the 2nd of May. So, apart from having to cancel your wedding and then end up being here instead of the Seychelles, how are you, Katie? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, to be honest, Joe, I think even in my worst nightmare, I hadn't imagined that the Friday night of my honeymoon would be broadcast on the BBC. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on Paul's team is uh, stand-up comedian Ivo Graham. Now, Ivo, you have quite a lot in common with Boris Johnson. You went to Eton and Oxford and you recently had a child. And to be honest, I wouldn't trust you to lead us out of a global pandemic either. Um, unless you've got any suggestions, have you? No. Nope. Uh, I think the last thing anyone wants is another Eaton Chancer weighing in with their suggestions. OK, as we move on, um, as criticism Joe, Joe, of when, the... Joe, Joe what? When, when did she actually start sculpting this head? Do you know? <laughs> oh. <laughs> He's really upset now. I, I can hear it in the tone. Do you want a sculpture of your own head, Paul? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, in the news this week, as criticism of the government deepens, Health Secretary Matt Hancock refuses to do an interview unless it's given a very large vodka. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Very good. <laughs> Blimey, how desperate was he for a drink? I know how he feels. I've got to drink a large vodka to listen to him talking. And with an increasing number of TV shows being made from home, the new Spanish host of Saturday Kitchen gets off to an inauspicious start. Tiene que tener la harinita y todo. Ustedes ponen el pancito acá y cogen el islero y le tienen que hacer presión, ¿ya? I spent that whole video trying to predict how that was going to go wrong and you just didn't see that. No, that was brilliant. Let's get on with the show. And we start with the bigger stories of the week. Um, Ian and Katie, take a look at this. Uh, that's the Prime Minister trying to work out where he is. Quick vodka, that might help. Oh, love 15 or is it 30? Who's counting? And we can go to garden centres if you live in England. And the magic money tree, he's found it. So he's giving it to everyone, including building workers. It's the most peculiar week. I mean, someone obviously briefed all the press and all the media at the beginning of the week saying, we're opening up, uh, lockdown's easing, pubs open, schools, it's great, we're all back to work. And then by the end of the week, Boris is on on Sunday night and says, uh, no, no, none of that's happening at all. 
And then uh, poor old Chancellor, he's told, oh, well, um, the, the uh, furloughing is going to end um, soon. And then he comes on and says, no, it isn't. So obviously the government can't even agree amongst themselves what's happening. And Boris turned out and he couldn't even fill 15 minutes of prime time. I mean, it was literally just waffling to the end. And people said it's a very mixed message. And I thought it was absolutely clear. I don't know what I'm doing. No lack of clarity there. I don't think you've had what we could call a smooth rollout this week from the government. Um, we had this. <laughs> it's pretty simple, really. Ian. ultimately, if we get to the advice now, you can meet your parents in a park one by one if they <laughs> sit in a car and take it in turns, perhaps. Um, or you can pay them money to come and clean your house. Or you could put your house on the market and then you can see if your parents want to buy your house, in which case they could visit it. Providing we can buy houses, I think everything's fine, isn't it? That's what I got. Dominic Rabb said that you could uh, play tennis as long as you didn't hang around in the clubhouse afterwards. And he also said uh, that window cleaners would be able to go back to work as long as they only did the outside of the windows. So <laughs> you're getting an incredibly piecemeal approach to everyone's working lives from Dominic Rabb on his sort of manic media Monday. I believe one of the things you are allowed to do is pose for sculpture in your own home. I think that's been <laughs> opened up now. You can, you can do that. I love how much it hurts. <laughs> Bitterly. Having hyped up the sun to say pubs are going to open, everything's going to be back, it turned into the most middle-class easing ever. Tennis is all right, golf, fishing, nannies are back, and you're cleaner. Does that, does that cover everything? Probably not for most of the population. <laughs> of course, he also changed the slogan from stay home, protect the NHS, save lives, to stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Stay alert. I mean, that's a terrorist threat. I mean, alert to what? You can't actually control the virus, can you? That's, that's a meaningless thing. The, the virus can't be controlled. No, it, it, it's shown no signs of it so far. Everyone was told to go back to work on Wednesday if they couldn't work from home, but to avoid using public transport if possible. Slightly galling as well, I think, to be told to go back to work by Boris Johnson, who's had quite a laissez-faire approach to his own duties, you know, in the first few months of his prime ministerial career. If you run back over it, it's been election, party, Christmas, holiday, get Brexit done, holiday. Intensive care. Oh, yeah, well, of course, there was sick leave and there was paternity leave. And uh, now he's popped up again to announce staying alert. And then it's presumably resign, holiday, strictly memoirs, which is a lovely uh, <laughs> way to see it all out. A lot of people expected lockdown to be relaxed even more. Why? It was in the papers. It was because the press told told them it would be relaxed. In and broadcasters. Yes. Don't, don't okay. let them off. It was the entire media said the same thing, presumably because they'd been told this. I mean, I'm not saying it was Dominic Cummings because I have no proof of that. <laughs> <laughs> but was it, Ian? Was it? <laughs> I think it would be wrong at this point to speculate. I think we've just got to flatten him. I think the problem is there's lots of people in government who would like it to be extended more. So we're getting quite um, divided briefing at the moment because there's always one camp that wants it to go further than it actually is. And probably the Tory mm. party as a whole and the cabinet would like the lockdown to be eased quite a lot more than Boris even has. Um, they think it's quite tame. So we're in the uncomfortable position of Boris being responsible. <laughs> I hope is that's it... not what you're saying. What uh, was the concession on Monday regarding socialising with other people? Um, well, I've not really been paying much attention, to be honest, <laughs> but is it something to do with um, you're, you're, you're allowed to meet uh, other people providing their modelling you in clay? Was it something like that? <laughs> <laughs> if this bust isn't ready for next week, it will be a <laughs> well, exactly scandal. Exactly. You know, working class people, uh, you know, represented in, in art forms. It'd be very good. You're allowed to meet one member of another household. This unfortunately came just a few days too late for Randy Professor uh, Neil Ferguson. Is that his official title at Imperial, the Randy Professor? I don't think it's official. I think he's he's just borrowed it from a vicar for a couple of weeks. <laughs> What's going to happen at primary school? 
at primary school, we are going to begin to get primary schools coming back potentially as early as June. But I think that's more um, the prime minister's hope than any trade unions or anyone in an opposition party. They say they need their own PPE and protective uh, wear to go back into schools. And also there's then the small issue, which is apparently the children socialize too much of each other. And um, teachers say that actually would be quite hard to um, police. That's right. I think teachers think it's impossible to keep children uh, two metres apart. Although I'm quite surprised. I mean, don't they actually learn about metres at school with that kind of clicky wheel thing that they've got? Anyway, um, <laughs> now, <laughs> don't you remember going with the clicky wheel round the playground? I remember that and I was <laughs> born in 1432. <laughs> We don't have enough face masks, but do we have enough clicky wheels to open the schools again? I think maybe not. Well, I, I was I was taught in imperial measurements. It was all feet and yards and inches. <laughs> and then as soon as I learned that, it all went metric. <laughs> Up yours, thicko. That's the message I got. I think that sounds like <laughs> quite a harsh school you've got there, Paul. Very harsh school. That was our school <laughs> motto. Up yours, thicko. <laughs> but it was in Latin. <laughs> Up um, you um, thicko um, us. <laughs> We had it on our school cap, written backwards, so when we looked in the mirror, we could see it the right way round. Do you think we could have Up Yours Thicko inscribed on the sculpture of Paul that we've all jointly commissioned this oh, don't, episode? Don't put that idea out there, because that's what's <laughs> going to happen now, isn't it? <laughs> Across the forehead, Paul, as you yourself yeah. described. Yeah, exactly. Super Vobis Densorum. I can see it now. <laughs> you want to get some ointment for that? <laughs> So, according to The Times, the head of the National Education Union suggested spraying children with disinfectant <laughs> as they arrive at the school gate. Head teachers are insisting that they need to see the science that explains why children can't pass the virus on. Uh, Paul, what have the government pledged to do uh, with the scientific advice? Uh, ignore it. Well, no, rather unexpectedly, they've pledged to publish it all uh, in the spirit of openness and transparency and started this week with this document. <laughs> <laughs> if you take that down to a supermarket, you get a packet of fish fingers for nothing. <laughs> Well, the bits that are missing allegedly cover scientists who were critical of some of the government's thinking. Um, and Ian, how are rail commuters going to cope with train travel? With difficulty, I think. They keep um, disagreeing over whether you should put on more trains so that people will be more spread out or cut the number of trains, which seems to be what they're doing, to discourage people from going at all. So I, I can't quite work out what you're meant to do. You're going to have to book a time slot to uh, get on the train um, through a smartphone app when you're not using your <laughs> coronavirus app or your Tesco's home delivery app or your Weatherstones app. Uh, Weatherspoons, not Weatherstones. What is Weatherstones? Is it anything? Oh, it's no. great. It's a pub with a library in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's Waterstones and Weatherstones. What a great idea. This is the news that Boris Johnson has announced a roadmap out of lockdown. Actually, looking at the map, Boris, I think we took a wrong turn about three months ago. <laughs> the new rules say you should go to work uh, if you can't do your job from home, although it's still not clear what to do if you're Matt Hancock and you can't do your job wherever you are. <laughs> so, Paul and Ivo, here's your question. Yeah. It's simply this, on or off. I'm going to list some events or activities and I want you to tell me where on the scale they are, OK? So if you look at this, uh, there we go. Maybe, unlikely, off. And I'm going to start with you, Paul. Angling. Angling, likely. Yeah, very likely. On, 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 on. OK. <laughs> On. Yeah, you're right. Yes, angling Good. is on. It's on, at yeah. least in England. Yeah. Um, great news for all those anglers who've been sat at home all day doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> what is also now permitted in England as long as you absolutely do not touch your flagpole? Golf. Yes, golf does lend itself to social distancing. Um, I mean, no one wants to be seen standing next to a man wearing a Pringle jumper. Uh, a man holding a tube of Pringles, well, very different matter. <laughs> Although, according to the BBC, the traditional friendly four ball is a thing of the past. I thought a four ball was what my cat, Colin, keeps getting. <laughs> <laughs> Just before he throws up on the floor. I've now been displaced. I got a load of letters last week that didn't say, Dear Sir or Dear Editor. They said, Dear Colin's owner. Oh, no. <laughs> Which is tragic. Oh. 
Well, when the sculpture of Paul's head is there, Colin will be a thing of the past. I bet you next week it will be a sculpture of that bloody cat. I still won't have it. Here, look, it's like Colin. <laughs> Katie, are you up for the next one? Football, on or off? Probably on, um, but it has to meet some conditions first. So we might get football from June um, and there are discussions underway, but there's lo I think there has to be a cultural change in terms of how footballers approach the game. And if you uh, do a tackle, you've got to look to the side after um, to, to make it work. Who's not happy about this? Do you know? He does work Me. in the area of football. Ian, yeah, you don't work <laughs> in the area of football, Ian. Come on. Oh, little do you know, Joe. Sorry. Are you a referee at local level, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's an England footballer, Danny Rose. Do yes. we know who Danny Rose is? Yes. He thinks it's far too early to be thinking of bringing uh, back football, saying it puts people's lives at risk. I don't give a fuck about the nation's morale. And Danny Rose thinks the same. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the Premier League's return is still in the balance. Some clubs have objected to playing matches in neutral grounds uh, because of the sterile, lifeless atmosphere, as it would give uh, Arsenal home advantage. <laughs> the Dorset Knob Throwing Festival, on or off? Uh, I think the Dorset Knob Throwing Festival is surely off. By all means, chuck your knob around in the privacy of your own home but I don't think people are allowed to meet up and do it yet. That is correct. So yes, the festival's off. Normally an annual event attracting about 8,000 people and involves obviously people hurling the traditional Dorset biscuit or knob as far as possible. Yeah, unfortunately this year we won't be able to see any signs like this. <laughs> what is an, a knob uh, cake? There's a Dorset knob is a baked biscuit often eaten after being dipped in cider. Well, no one's eating properly during lockdown, are they? Paul, you're next. Milky tea, on or off? Yeah, you can drink milky tea. Why, why would you not be able to drink milky tea? Well, it's not so much would you be able to drink it or not, but it's you've got to drink much more. Why would that be? Have, have we got a milk mountain? Yes. The dairy industry has been totaled by um, closure of restaurants and cafes. According to the Grocer Trade magazine, the 12-week campaign will focus on driving the tea, coffee and milky drink usage occasions. <laughs> oh, God. Nothing I like more than a milky drink usage occasion. <laughs> oh, well, let's go back to restaurant closures then. Why did police in Queensland think an illegal social gathering was going on in a Brisbane eatery, Ian? And did someone have a household of 20 people and they were all out eating together? Waxworks. You're not far off there. The owner had made use of some mannequins that were being thrown away by the neighbouring hair salon and he thought it would make the restaurant look less empty and depressing if he did this. Well, once again, you're showing me busts of people. Is this something just to wind me up or something? I mean... Oh, thanks. Oh, there's more of them. Thanks very much. What's this, what's this place called? The Decapitation Cafe? <laughs> yeah, but the police must have been quite worried if they thought this was real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not just lockdown breaking. This is literally £30 a head. <laughs> uh, right, time now for the odd one out round. Uh, just one between you this week. So, um, fingers on buzzers. You have got buzzers, haven't you? I brought uh, a child, one of my daughter's toys. Uh, which makes this sound. Paul, you've got a head off a cafe in Adelaide, I believe. Oh, no, it's a whole... God, he's so desperate he's brought along his own sculpture. <laughs> yeah, my own sculpture. Uh, I, my own sculpture will be doing an impression of Prince Charles. <laughs> uh, Katie? Yeah, I've got um, some non-branded painkillers, but if you shake them, they sound a bit like a maraca. Well, by coincidence, um, I actually have maracas. <laughs> Last week, I had some castanets, which I rather stupidly said were maracas, and I got a load of abuse from people who said, you are an idiot. You don't know the difference between a maraca and a castanet. So just to say, sorry about the error. Um, that's my buzzer. That's lovely. 
Okay, so your four are uh, 87,000 British people, John Stumpy Peeps, Brian May and Charles Ingram. Uh, my my friend Barry Wilson is doing his impression of Prince Charles, but it's, because it's non-verbal, you can't really hear him. <laughs> this is gardening accidents. Yes, Paul. The, the 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 drummer from the film Spinal Tap, which I saw again recently, stands up very well. Excellent film. He died through uh, a bizarre gardening accident in the film, and uh, Brian May had a, a a bizarre gardening accident as well, where he's hurt his bum. Uh, I didn't see any of the headlines on his on his bum accident, but I presume bum ha bohemian ruptury or something. I think Charles Ingram also had a gardening accident. Oh. Oh, right. Yeah, I, so 87,000 people didn't have a garden. Oh, no. The drummer's gardening accident was the only one that was fatal. That is a correct answer. They've all been injured uh, gardening, except for John Stumpy Peeps, who died, as you said, in a gardening accident. Uh, he was the original drummer in the fictional band, as you said, Paul Spinal Tap. Uh, here are the rest of the group talking about his demise. The first drummer was uh, the John Stumpy Peeps. Oh, yeah. Great, great. Uh, Tall, blonde, geek with glasses. Yeah. Uh, good drama. Great look. Good drama. Good, yeah. Good yeah, drama. Fine drama. What happened to him? He died. He he died in a bizarre gardening accident some years back. It's so really it one of those what? things. It was, you know, the authorities said, you know, best leave it. You know, it's not unsolved, yeah. really. You know. What did Brian May do to himself in his garden? Yeah, it was a very enthusiastic gardening accident where he tore his buttocks. You're making this up. He tweeted it during the week. I think it'll make its way into the papers soon. <laughs> Once again, Ian's failure to follow Brian May on Twitter costs him dear. <laughs> <laughs> this is what Brian May said. I managed to rip my gluteus maximus to shreds in a moment of over-enthusiastic gardening. OK, last year, 87,000 Brits suffered gardening injuries. What were the most common? I bet it's the slapstick thing of standing on a, a hoe and it coming up and hitting you in the face. A rake, I mean, not a hoe. I thought originally you were quoting rap lyrics at us. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Merton stands on a hoe. <laughs> no, let me tell you, it's repetitive strain and joint pain. From bending to weed. I'm just adding some medical detail. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> to balance out the rap lyrics. Straight out of Compton Burnett. <laughs> <laughs> I've set off my buzzer. I've enjoyed that so much. How did quiz cheat Charles Ingram injure himself in the garden? Didn't he cut off a couple of his toes or something? Uh, correct. He did. He cut off three of them. Good grief. Well, he actually said at the time, I remember seeing my big toe lying on the grass and thinking, oh, dear. Right, uh, they've all been injured gardening, except for John Stumpy Peeps, who died in a gardening accident. Here's Brian May. Uh, details of the gardening accident are still sketchy, but I'm guessing his wife was cutting his hair with a strimmer. <laughs> Brian May described how he injured his buttocks in a gardening accident. Well, he says it's a gardening accident. There could be a, a badger on heat out there that misread the signals. <laughs> Time now for the Missing Words round, which this week features as its guest publication, International Piano. It's a good read, although you have to get someone else to turn the pages. <laughs> and we start with... Suspect hiding from police in bushes gives himself away by what? Suspect hiding from police in bushes gives himself away by playing Rachmaninoff's first piano concerto on a twig. <laughs> Suspect hiding from police in bushes gives himself away by breaking wind. This week, a fugitive in Nottinghamshire was apprehended by police after breaking wind and giving away his location. I'm not sure what the man was accused of, but he denied it and was immediately charged with supplying it. <laughs> Pianist Viv McLean has what hidden behind what? Heart of gold hidden behind cold exterior. Uh, Pianist Viv McLean has bare... Hidden behind back. Pianist Viv McLean has fingers of steel hidden behind muscles of velvet. Ooh. Oh. This is about a CD of Chopin's Nocturne and Polonaise. And I'm not sure the government counts it as essential Chopin or non-essential Chopin. <laughs> <laughs> Next. 
Italian bear wanted by the authorities for what? Finally tracked down after nine months on the run. Uh, highly illegal honey fraud business. <laughs> <laughs> I know this. This is breaking picnic regulations. He he went down to the woods and all his friends went with him. I think his name was Teddy. <laughs> and finally they got him. Quite right too. Italian bear wanted by the authorities for stealing honey and cow chasing, finally tracked down after nine months on the run. This is a bear in northern Italy who's been terrorising locals. According to The Times, one of the attacks committed by the bear during his time on the run was violently shaking a caravan with two terrified shepherds in it. <laughs> well, it is frustrating when you've got some tin food but no tin opener, isn't it? <laughs> uh... <laughs> shepherd's pie. <laughs> Mysterious what left outside Gwyneth Paltrow's goop shop? I think I know this. Uh, mysterious excrement left outside Gwyneth Paltrow's goop shop. It's mysterious wheelbarrows of manure. People are asking why someone would tip out a wheelbarrow of manure onto the pavement outside Gwyneth Paltrow's shop. Because it was shut. <laughs> and lastly, 9-11 was a bad time for what? Piano competitions. 9-11. It's terribly difficult to do. Really tricky time. <laughs> Piano owners. And the final scores are Ian and Katie have five and Paul and Ivo have five. Oh. Yes, what a lovely, happy ending. That's nice. But before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. Open the churches. <laughs> <laughs> Boris Johnson regrets setting up zip wire over nunnery. Angry nuns shoot at heaven. <laughs> <laughs> Hang glider suffers nun shot wounds. <laughs> hey. Nun rebellion. Not so superior now, mother. <laughs> Sisters are shooting it for themselves. <laughs> and on that note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and Katie Balls, Paul Merton and Ivo Graham. And I leave you with the news that as people find alternative ways to get back to work, one man thinks his new mode of transport doesn't have quite the same impact. <laughs> <laughs> At a military parade in Pyongyang, Western observers begin to realise they may have overestimated North Korea's nuclear capability. <laughs> 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 and in Essex, the winner of One Street's Marc Francois lookalike contest is just too close to call. <laughs> <laughs> Good night! Charlie Brooker's antiviral wipe special went down a storm last night. Check it out on BBC iPlayer. Will Ferrell is a Eurovision fan. He's even got the jacket. Much to Graham's delight. From this sofa to ours at quarter to 11 on BBC One. Silence! The time is nigh.